How many chances? The sentence should be carried out. Should someone get? You can call it execution, but it's killing. WRAL's David Crabtree talks with death row inmates. But if it's God's will for me to die here by execution, I wouldn't have it no other way. And families of murder victims. He sat down the stand and told how he shot my daddy. Are death row penalty appeals just or just too much? Time to die. A 5 News documentary. Every 12 hours, a murder is committed in North Carolina. At that rate, you might think death row would be packed. You might also think a murder every 12 hours would mean the execution chamber would be very busy. But by now, you probably know that's not the case. Good evening, I'm David Crabtree. This is cell block E, commonly referred to as death row at Central Prison in Raleigh. It is supposed to be the last home convicted killers will ever know. But not all convicted killers in this state end up here. And for those who do, they may spend years, as many as 15 or more, in this facility before their execution is carried out. For others, they may leave the row because their sentence is reduced. But bottom line, this can become a lifelong residence for death row inmates because of four words, the process of appeals. Some people think a lengthy process of appeals is the only true balance for the scales of justice. What is looked at is not just what went on at the trial, but some things that didn't go on at the trial. What evidence wasn't presented? Who didn't testify? Was there evidence that was withheld? But others tell us once the jury has spoken. The Senate should be carried out, and it should be carried out uh, within two years. I don't think that we should draw with, uh, draw an appeal process out any longer than that. It's ridiculous. Yeah, when you do, you destroy the anything that the death penalty might, a deterrence that the death penalty might have. During the next half hour, the frustrations and the favoritism of punishment that is often sure, but not always swift. A crime scene in eastern North Carolina. What happened here years ago has dramatically affected several lives. On the night of January 20th, 1992, Kinston Insurance Executive Billy White drove to this old logging road in rural Lenore County. He was here to meet a prospective business client named Timmy Connors. Now the appointment had been set by White's wife. White was very aggressive and assertive and was known as the type of insurance salesman that would go anywhere at any time to sell a policy. But that night would be the last sales call Billy White would ever make because when he got here there was no Timmy Connors. However, he was met by two men. The first, Linwood Taylor a small-time drug dealer and part-time informant for the Lenore County Sheriff's Department. Taylor was joined by his uncle, Ernest Baisden. And five minutes and two shotgun blasts after Billy White arrived, he lay dead. Within days, police began to piece together their case. The bizarre and emotional story surrounding it was about to begin to unfold. First, a fellow informant tips the authorities, and three weeks after the murder, Linwood Taylor is arrested. Taylor confessed to killing Billy White, that he did it for money, a lot of money, $20,000. And guess who Taylor says put him up to it? The victim's wife, Sylvia Ipoch White. The money would come from the insurance agent's insurance policy. And as Taylor spun his jailhouse defense, he changed his story. Now he says he didn't pull the trigger, but he knew who did. His uncle, Ernest Baston. Two days later, the SBI questions Baisden, and he admits to killing Billy White. But the murder trail doesn't stop there. White's widow was arrested for conspiracy to commit murder, but Taylor wasn't finished. He claims Sylvia White once told him, quote, killing someone is easy. I know, I've done it. I kill my stepson. Billy White II was four when he died in 1972. With no autopsy, the coroner ruled death by accident. That little Billy White choked on a piece of plastic garment bag. But now, Linwood Taylor's revelation was so startling, police couldn't pass it up. And 20 years after the four-year-old was buried, his body was exhumed. And this time, an autopsy revealed the plastic had been stuffed down his throat and his skull was fractured. So while waiting to be tried for the killing of her husband, 
Sylvia White was convicted of murdering her stepson and sentenced to life in prison. In April of 1993, Ernest Beesden is tried and convicted of killing Billy White. And on Good Friday, the jury hands down the harshest possible sentence, death. Earlier this year, four years after Billy White is murdered, his widow pleads guilty to conspiring to kill him and is sentenced to a second life term. A month later, Linwood Taylor is finally sentenced. He too gets life in prison. Even though all the murder defendants are charged under the same law, carrying the same potential penalties, only Ernest Baston, who was tried three years before the others, receives the death penalty. An automatic appeal, guaranteed by law, was filed and denied. Are there times when you just feel like saying, man, I can't fight this anymore? Myself, no, because I know there is hope. There may be hope because Baisden has a new set of attorneys, paid for by taxpayers, attorneys who are steering the latest round of appeals. Back in 1993, his first attorney developed cancer and had to leave the case two months before it came to trial. Another attorney was appointed to my case. Uh, within 60 days, my trial started, and we were just unprepared. You know, I had an attorney that with 40 years of experience told me that he was as ready as he'd ever be. And the, the only thing I could, as fast as things were going, uh, the only thing I could rely on was, was uh, putting my faith in him, you know, and, and believe in what he told me. Now Baston's new attorneys are questioning that faith, questioning whether Beesden was fairly represented. There's things about Ernest's case which are just amazing. His new team, appointed this past January, wants a new trial, or at least a new sentencing hearing. Were the constitutional requirements satisfied? I don't think so. And it should be scrutinized very carefully when, when what is at stake is, is human life. Martin and his team are convinced their work is essential, not only to their client, but to our judicial system as we know it. However, those who fight the battle from the other side of the courtroom are equally committed. If they can cause enough problems that people will eventually just throw up their hands and say, you know, we, we just need to do away with capital punishment. Uh, and I'd, I would hate to give in to that type of attack and that type of approach. We, we have a finite amount of judicial resources. We have situations where people have made frivolous claims and have abused those resources. And yet, if we, if we throw the bathwater out, we might throw the baby out with it. This claim isn't frivolous. This claim is a real claim. This new appeal, several hundred pages, known officially as a motion for appropriate relief, makes serious claims beyond the original charge of poor representation. There are sworn statements from members of the jury who state a fellow juror who had worked for the Department of Correction convinced them the death sentence actually meant life in prison. Juror Fanny Keith Fennell said under oath, I never intended for the defendant to be executed. I thought the death sentence would keep him in prison longer so that he could learn his lesson. The chapters of this new motion read like a murder mystery, but Barry McNeil has read similar books before. It is so difficult at each level uh, that, in my opinion, the, the possibility of an innocent person being executed in the state of North Carolina in the modern times is so inf infinitesimally small that I don't see it as a danger. But what about the reaction of family members of a murder victim? We'll hear their story when we come back. On North Carolina's death row, there are 147 killers waiting to die. Some have been here for more than 15 years. The average time frame for appeals in this state is nine years. The cost to all of us? Close to $200,000 each, according to the Terry Sanford Institute of Public Policy. State lawmakers have begun to change that. 10 days ago, they voted to cut the appeals process by one year. Ideally, it's gonna be hard to get an execution carried out less than five to six years from the time of, of sentencing. Barry McNeil has worked for 17 years as Special Deputy Attorney General. His job, making sure the decisions of capital crime juries are administered, that every sentence of death 
handed down in this state is carried out. One of my colleagues is called the mistress of death, and uh, I've been called that doctor of death. He's also convinced there's much to be gained by compressing the expensive process. People just do not believe that the government has the guts to carry out uh, and enforce the laws that we have on the books today. I intend to be at Basin's execution. And what about the families of the victims, those whose lives are destroyed in a different way? Could a quicker appeals process speed the healing? Teresa Murray is Billy White's only daughter. This is my Bible. You know, people wanted to look at it and take it and copy it, and they don't believe my sight. I mean, She's kept this detailed account of her father's anyway. story, partially because the trauma of his death placed a barricade around her memory. For days, the only thing she felt were the tears in her eyes. And like I said, I do intend to be there when he is executed, if and when he ever is. And that will put a final to that to that one, but there's so many involved in this particular case, you know, I don't know. I look around and is there ever an end? Unless you're asking families and victims to put closure, how can you? When the state or the government, whatever, won't put a, help you do that. I try to explain to them that uh, it's what our system, as it is presently constituted, what it presently tolerates. Uh, it tolerates a lot of built-in delay in the case. And that's frustrating for McNeil, who is convinced family members like the Whites will never see justice and can never experience the sunset of their anger as long as their father's killer is alive. This happened in January of 92, and we've been in and out of court. I've been in eight different counties to different courthouses for hearings, motions, trial, jury selections, whatever. It's been a very ex expensive trial on my part as a victim. Uh, they didn't reimburse me for my time to have to go to three counties over to, for jury selection, but they made sure that the prisoner was fed and carried and at state cost. Um, jurors, judges, lawyers, everybody but the victim's family. A significantly shorter appeals process could bring something else. So many have been on death row for so long, there could be as many as a dozen executions a year, one per month in North Carolina by 1998. It's just tough on everybody. This is Charlie Mears, a man who speaks from experience. Mears worked for the Department of Correction for almost 40 years, 35 of those as superintendent in Gastonia. Everybody concerned it is no good to have the appeal process drawn out. It's expensive, it's, it serves no purpose. As we said, Charlie Mears speaks yes, from experience because his experience with capital punishment right. is far different than most of us will ever know. This is a letter eight-year-old Charlie Mears wrote to his father. I love you, Daddy. I think of you all the time. I hope you will come home soon. Your loving son. Typical words from a little boy who loved his father very deeply. A little boy who was about to grow up very quickly. These are letters Charlie's father wrote to his mother while his dad was a prisoner on North Carolina's death row. He told, you know, he talked about how it was how heart wrenching it was to to be there and yet and face death, you know. And I remember visiting him in the jail there at Lumberton, and I was eight years old. I remember going to see him. And Charlie's father killed his uncle. They were competing bootleggers in Robinson County and got into a fight over business. Mr. Mears was defended by a court-appointed attorney. And only a few months after his conviction, seven minutes of gas in this room ended his life. That was 54 years ago. Charlie Mears is convinced, had the crime happened today, his dad would have served five to 10 years for manslaughter and never faced execution. And even though the loss of his dad still hurts, Charlie Mears has never wavered in his support of the death penalty. Like that. It's really on, fair to the person, the individual, you know. Uh, why linger? Uh, why prolong it for years and years? Uh, when, I mean, it can have a, a finality to it, you know. It's over, and, and let's get on with our lives. And those who are waiting to die ask families to consider this. That uh, 
that our system has flaws. And, and there's, there's too much chance of mistakes, too much chance of uh, convicting an innocent person. Uh, when, you, when you've uh, executed somebody, you can't bring them back. You found out that there was mistakes made, there was evidence that wasn't brought forth or for whatever reason. It's too late then. As Ernest Beesden waits on death row, his attorneys continue their fight. When Beesden's appeal, the motion for appropriate relief is heard this month, the attorneys will present a variety of reasons as to why their client should have a new trial, or at least a chance for a different sentence. Bottom line, get Ernest Beesden off death row. All of this new information will fall under the heading Mitigating Circumstances, starting with a troubled childhood. His father was 64 when Ernest was born, the last of 10 children. When he was 14, his father, then 78, gave Ernest his first beer. It was the beginning of a long road to alcohol and drug abuse. At an early age, Ernest, like most children, formed friendships. One of his early friends and childhood confidants was Linwood Taylor. Taylor, only six months younger, was also his nephew. They became lifelong and best friends. A friend who would bring him into a murder-for-hire plot some 35 years later. The attorneys will argue Bayston was easily manipulated and suffered from depression, that he was high on cocaine and other drugs at the time of the murder, that the drugs were supplied by Linwood Taylor to induce their client into the killing scheme, that he was high on marijuana at the time he confessed. They will also argue Bayston was poorly represented at his first trial, that he was never told he did not have to testify, that his case was poorly prepared, that the jury was misled by some of its own members. The attorneys will argue these and other factors should keep Ernest Bayston out of here, the state's execution chamber. But while they argue, they cannot deny one basic fact. Billy White is dead, murdered in cold blood. His children want someone to pay the price for the death of their father, and they think they've waited long enough. The Ernest Bayston trial, I felt like he deserved a death penalty. He sat up there on the stand and told how he shot my daddy, how he walked around him, and how he held the gun, and how he shot him a second time, and things like that. And in my gut then, I wanted him to die. The execution of Ernest Bayston would be a manifest injustice of the most grievous magnitude. If, if Billy White's children heard you say what you just said, what do you think they would say? I don't know. I mean, their loss is a real loss. And what happened to Mr. White cannot be, the clock can't be turned back. But killing Ernest Baston, and, and that's what it is. I mean, you can call it execution, but it's killing. Killing Ernest Basin isn't going to correct that, and it isn't going to bring justice to this situation. On death row, Basin, the convicted killer, has become Basin, the convicted and forgiving Christian. Those who counsel him tell us it's for real, and he feels deep regret and sorrow. He's completed dozens of Bible correspondence courses and regularly helps with the communion service for death row inmates. He appears to be a man at peace with everyone, even Linwood Taylor. Me being angry at him is not going to help my situation. It hurt me a lot more than it helped. And, it's, and uh, me being angry at him is uh, not going to affect him as much as it does me. He's become a friend and counselor to others on the row. Philip Engel was one of his friends. Ingle is the last person executed in North Carolina. This is part of a poem Ingle wrote for Baston. We haven't known each other very long, but I feel our friendship is really strong. We'll meet someday when we leave this earth in a place that will be better than our first birth. Your friend in Christ, Philippines.
Lethal injection has become the new American way of execution, the most acceptable method of stopping the human heart from beating. Polls tell us, as Americans, we can stomach lethal injection easier than the electric chair or the gas chamber. Is there an acceptable alternative? If the state of North Carolina would have something called life without parole, I could have lived with that. But I don't think this person should ever walk on the streets again. I don't think any of them should. In 1994, state lawmakers passed a law designed to do just that. But even that new law has a potential way out to escape life in prison without parole. There is a uh, provision that after a period of 25 years, a superior court judge will take a look at the case and make a recommendation to the governor as to whether or not the governor should commute or grant any type of relief. So there is a form of review. So in, in effect, it's not called parole, but there is a form of review of the sentence after a certain period of time. That law is for murder cases after 1994. For Billy White's family and for more than 100 existing death row cases, the law was too little, too late. We're a human being. Life means as much to us as it does everybody else. There is no question Ernest Baisden would like to leave death row alive. But if he doesn't, if his latest appeal is denied, this man is convinced he's done all he could do. Are you prepared for that? Yeah. I don't claim to know God's will, but if it's God's will for me to die here by execution, I wouldn't have it no other way. And I mean that with my heart. If this latest appeal is denied, an execution date for Ernest Baisden could soon be set. Thank you.